Hello, everybody. So welcome to our webinar. So for the second edition of this Copernicus MOOC. So this is the webinar number nine. Um, yes, yeah, so we are very happy to welcome you today. And uh, we have a special guest today, Susan Coleman, who will uh, talk uh, about ideation and co-creation. So, um, as usual, this webinar is uh, one hour and a an half, and we will start with a presentation of Suzanne, which will be interactive, and then we will uh, end the webinar with a traditional uh, Q&A session. So, I hope you will enjoy it, and I will give the floor to Suzanne. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to this module on ideation. Um, we're going to be spending the next 90 minutes together, and um, I'm really excited to share this topic with you. It's a very um, passionate topic for me. Uh, uh, this is a real core of the work that I do, and um I really believe it will bring some very good value to the work that you all are doing as entrepreneurs around the Copernicus data. Uh, let me start by introducing myself and uh, I'm gonna start by explaining the situation to you. So like all of you, I'm working in my home office and I have been working here since last March. And up until now, my technology and I'm touching wood, has been a fantastic ally. And today, for some reason, I can't hear you. So um, our facilitators in the university will be helping, but I'm basically working from chat. So I apologize if anyone speaks up and I don't answer you, uh, but we'll be able to use the chat function, I think, quite effectively uh, uh, to be able to communicate. So, um, so I work at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I uh, work with clients who are building new products, new services, new solutions, going into new markets, looking for new clients. So in my view, I spend my days playing because I love this space. I love the innovation space. I love working on new challenging topic areas. And uh, I really believe Copernicus is a fantastic space to play. So, and I'm just reminding myself of the, can the facilitators help me? Because the even the arrows are not working for me today. So if you could move to the next page, please. Thank you. What I want to do today is uh, talk a little bit about our learning objectives. So my goal is to keep this as hands-on as possible and to give you some nice tangible skills that you can use and to answer your questions. So I'm very keen to have a discussion and uh, hear what you have to say or any of the challenges that you're facing, any of the questions that you have that I can help to answer. Uh, because I believe in co-creation, I won't be the only person to answer if there are other people in um, the population today. And we've got people from all over, I saw in the chat earlier. This is a, a place to share. So uh, as questions come up, please feel free to uh, jump in with your ideas, what's worked for you, uh, and we can have a, a really good uh, session that way. I want to start the session looking at target customers and creating personas, and I'll explain to you why I think that's so important. We're going to move from there to what I call the painstorming space, and this is really about finding good, tough questions, good, tough problems to be solved. Then we'll move into the reframing space, which for me <clears throat> is one of the most critical skills that you can learn. And doing that properly sets you up for success in the rest of your journey. We'll move from reframing to solution modeling, which is a really fun place to play, but the better you can do the preparatory work, that is the painstorming reframing work, the better solution modeling you'll have. And then we'll finish up and we'll talk about 
some of the things to come in the next module. So on that, if we could move to the next slide, please. The objectives, as I've said, I want you to understand the concepts, but more importantly, I want you to understand why they're important and how to use them. So I'm going to get really, really tangible about how I run these things, and I'm very, very happy to answer any of your questions on that. So <clears throat> I'm going to help you figure out how to identify your customers, how to plan and actually run painstorming sessions or reframing sessions, and what are the critical things to do with your solution modeling sessions. Now, Copernicus, and we can move to the next page. Copernicus for me <clears throat> provides the opportunity to solve problems in a way that we haven't been able to before. And you all know the exciting sectors that this opens up. But what I want to caution you about in this space is please don't start with the solution and then try to figure out where you can apply that solution. From my perspective, having worked in this sector for, for a fair time now, it's far more important to start with the problem you want to solve and then look to the Copernicus data and then look to the, the uh, opportunity space to figure out what you can bring to the table to solve a specific problem. But if you're not solving a problem, and Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, if you have not read uh, his books or seen his TED Talks, I really encourage you to go and look at that. Simon Sinek says, start with why. Why do people need to solve a specific problem? What is causing that problem? And that will help you uh, come to the solution space. So I agree with all of you. This is a fantastic, exciting opportunity to leverage this data. But let's figure out first the why behind what we're going to do. So I want to start at the beginning, and the beginning for me is the design thinking process. And um, I'd be very curious to know how many of you in the group have already done some studying in design thinking, and we can uh, look to the chat section for uh, any comments you have on that. Um, design thinking is all about following a process, and there are many, many schools of thought around design thinking. And whatever works for you in design thinking is fine. There is no one critical right approach. Um, there's some really good uh, um, articles on design thinking. One I like from the Harvard Business, Business Review, rather, and it's in the public space. If you look up why design thinking works, you'll get a really nice perspective on the, the why and the how of design thinking. So, in the approach that I use with my clients, I break it down into five areas. And um, the first area is around discovery. And this is where we really explore the problem space. We keep an open mind and we look for, uh, as it says on the page, human-centered insights. Now that's a fancy way to say, what problems do people have that we can find a solution for? What problems do people have that they are willing to pay to find a better way? And, you know, I do a lot of work uh, in the financial services space, and my clients are, generally speaking, impatient. And they're, generally speaking, uh, very keen to get quickly to, well, how do we fix it? How do we solve it? How do we move forward? And so it's very challenging to get them to spend time in that discover space. But what I can tell you from my experience is the more you get them in discovery mode, in learning mode, in thinking differently about a problem mode, the better the outcomes, the better the solutions. And um, I really encourage you to discover not only for yourself, but with others so that you get different perspectives and different ranges of thought. And, and here's my challenge to the group, I implore you to read up 
on people you disagree with. So on points of view that you disagree with. Because what it does, it does a couple of things. One is it fires up your brain in different ways because you'll look for reasons why specific arguments don't work. It will also make you question your own beliefs because perception, as we all know, drives so much of our view of the world. So getting yourself open to other ways of looking at the world will help you come up with better solutions. I truly believe that. The second area in the design thinking framework is around defining. So once you've done your discovery phase, you really need to define what is that big gnarly problem that you're going to solve. Don't think about how you're going to solve it, but what you're going to solve. And, um, you know, maximizing business value is one filter you can use. There are many, many other filters. This, this comes from work that I do with my financial services clients, and they are very focused on the bottom line. But finding problems we're solving for society, for humanity, for our ecology, for our animals, for nature, for there are many, many outcomes that we can be maximizing. It doesn't just have to be a financial outcome. So I think that's really important when we're talking about the problems worth solving. The third area is what if. And I love taking people to the what if space. So if you um, studied uh, De Bono, D-E-B-O-N-O, -E he'll talk about hats black hat thinking, blue hat thinking. And this is a way to take people into the white space. You need to find ways to let people free their brain from the standard, well, A plus B plus C or one plus one equals two, and find a way to ask the questions that let you go beyond or what is the sort of known territory. And I would say this is especially important in Copernicus because it offers such a range of opportunity that we just didn't have before. So you really need to um, focus on what if and being radical. And I'm going to, as we get into the painstorming and the problem space exploration more tangibly, I'm going to talk you through some of the exercises you can use uh, to do that. I should have double checked with my uh, facilitators. Um, I'm assuming that we are going to go through the materials and then open things up for questions. So can I just get, I'm looking at my chat. Can I just get confirmation that that is indeed how we're going to um, work today? Super. All right. So uh, for those of you um, eager to ask questions, just jot them down and uh, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, and um, as I said, the last time we did this, if there are any questions that we uh, don't get a chance to answer in the session, I'm quite happy to follow up by email. So please don't worry about that. Um, so we've gone to what if, then the prototyping, and I know prototyping is the topic of, I believe, the next module. So the prototyping space is where you get to test and iterate. You get to create what we call an um, MVP, minimal viable product, or a prototype, or a wireframe. There's all kinds of cool names for it. It can be as simple as using... Um, uh, uh, a uh, designs, uh, written designs to show what an application looks like. It can be something physical, tangible that's built out of wood. Um, I've used uh, Play-Doh, plasticine, kids' uh, materials, pipe cleaners. Prototypes are not fancy. Prototypes are a way to get feedback. That's what they do. So... Um, um, the idea around that phase, we're going to save for a later day. And then the last thing I would say is um, documentation. It's really important that you document your journey. So this journey is going to take you, it's never linear. It is never linear, my friends. So please, if that's what you're thinking today, please just forget about it. 
what happens is you start here, you want to get here, but the trip is a long winding road because we learn things along the way and that makes us adjust our thinking and that's a good thing. What's important, though, is to document your trip so that you don't have to come back and say, why, why did we take this turn, you know, two weeks ago or seven weeks ago? What was it that made us do that? So really, really important. I encourage you to document. Again, doesn't have to be fancy, doesn't have to be, you know, on uh, cotton paper, but you need a trail so that you can remind yourself where you've been what you've discarded as ideas and why. All right, let's keep moving forward. And I'm just going to turn on a light because all of a sudden the sun has disappeared and I think it's a little dark in my office. Super. All right. I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, what I call the double diamond and um, uh, a, because it reminds me of skiing, one of my passions, and so it just makes me happy. And second, because it reminds me to take that double step to the solution. And here's how it works. So you start out and you think you have a fantastic problem to solve. And what you try to do is you try to discover things that add to that problem, that create choices for you, that give you a path. And once you feel like you've got lots of choices, and I'm going to show you how we do that in painstorming, then you need to start refining them down into a specific problem statement or opportunity statement, depending pessimist, optimist. So you need to start by First, expanding the number of problems or the characteristics of the problem and then refining them down. And then once you've got a really good problem to solve, then what you do is start thinking about, well, how could we do that? And that's a really fun phase where you develop your what if and you allow yourself to do the blue hat to think about different permutations, ways to solve that problem. Then again, once you've come up with those what ifs, you need to start refining them down so that you can build a prototype that you use to test your solution or your concept. And so that's a very iterative circle because once you test the prototype, you may need to go back to the problem space and start refining against the problem space again. So again, not a very linear path. You're going to do your double diamond of question and answer, and then you're going to iterate and refine your solution. So uh, in my experience with clients, going from problem to solution that actually hits the market, I would say we probably end up doing somewhere between six and a dozen refinements before we get it right. And we cheat a little bit because as we refine, we call them use cases. So you might end up with multiple use cases, but essentially what you're doing is refining your offer for different audiences, different markets. So let's keep moving forward. I wanted to share with you the overview of the solution space. So, so those of you who kind of need the big picture before we dive into the specifics, um, this is one uh, example of it. There, there are many others. Essentially, what you have on the left side of the page is the problem space and on the right side, the solution space. And one of the things I like about this illustration is that you see the problem space takes up as much time and energy as the solution space. And it's another way to say, don't rush to what you think is the answer. Give yourself time to play in that problem space and really understand what it is that users want you to solve for. And this uh, leads me to talking about users because in my world, in the design thinking world, the user is at the heart of what you're doing. So you're solving problems for people. You're not 
creating a solution because you've got some cool tech. You're not creating a solution because you need to make more money. You're figuring out what people need and you're bringing them something that solves that, uh, answers that need in a new, different, better way. If it's not different, if it's not better, it's not going to work. So for me, that is a really critical piece of learning uh, to take from this. Let's dig into identifying target customers. So we always start our projects thinking about the people who will use the solution. And we do that in a couple of different ways. Again, there are many different ways you can talk about the customer journey, create the customer persona. Whatever works for you is fine. What I'm going to do over the next couple of pages is just give you a few ideas to work with. And I really encourage you, as you're building your personas, work with at least three. In, in our work, it can range from three to as many as a dozen or 15. It gets a little heavy and the uh, on the high end, but for me, I'm comfortable. I'm generally working between six and nine personas uh, for the areas that I work in. And the, the thing I like about personas is it helps you humanize your target customer. It helps you think about them in really tangible ways. And I love it. I know our personas are working when our clients say, yeah, well, listen, don't forget about Carol. You know Carol needs to have dinner on the table by seven because when they start talking about personas as actual people, you know that they're invested in it and that they've understood the importance of the persona. Now, in this one, we're going to use three examples. So a farmer, a public authority, and a firefighter. And I just wanted to try to bring the concept to life for you. So here's the, here's the example that we came up with when we were developing this module. So we're a small company in Luxembourg, and we know that forest fires are a huge issue. Prevention of fires, reducing um, the uh, damage caused by fires. So we clarify what our goals are. So we want clear information. We want real-time information. We want to be able to determine the impact on deforestation. We want to be able to give reports daily, and we want to make sure that we're informing citizens in the fire area. Now, those are all different goals that might lead to different outcomes. So what we do in this instance, um, and this we call our, um, our persona canvas. We're, we're very big on using canvas uh, templates in PwC. And that goes back to what I said earlier about making sure you're documenting. I also like a canvas because I can put this up on a big board when I'm working with clients and allow them access to it. So they're the ones who own it and they're the ones who are adding to it. So here's a persona that we've developed based on the scenario. And um, so um, We've got uh, a fellow who works uh, as an environmental counselor, uh, and um, the, we, we use Sydney in this case. Uh, this was done last summer when we had a lot of forest fires in, in the Australian outback, um, and uh, many inhabitants were seeing their houses burned down. We wanted for that regional authority to think about well, what what is it? What are their behaviors and habits? How does the solution fit into what they need to get done? So, I find it really helpful as you're developing the personas to at least be two people to do this. And if you can bring in a third or fourth people and get a range of ideas and um, perspectives, that's helpful too. It doesn't need to be somebody who knows your area. It doesn't even need to be somebody uh, who understands the space. So in fact, many times you can get great advice from little kids. So I like 
thinking about how a 12 year old would answer these questions versus a 20 versus a 40 year old, because the, the behavior changes and what's important becomes a lot more primary, if you want to say it that way. So what we do is we go through the behaviors and habits of this person, their particular pain points. So what are the things that really are a problem for them that you would like your solution to solve? Attitudes and sentiments are critically important because perception and attitude drives behavior. So it's really important that we understand as much as we can what their attitudes are and then their goals. And I like to separate goals into personal and professional goals because your solution, while it might be something they use in their professional life, it might also help them achieve a personal goal. And I'll give a for instance. So in this case, this regional authority, he's got his heart set on uh, a new role and he's got his heart set on becoming a supervisor. Well, that's a personal goal that if he does a great job here, if he solves a significant problem here, it could contribute to his personal goal of getting his promotion. So that's the kind of canvas that we use. I encourage you to use these, keep them visible if you can. So in your working space, wherever that is, put them up on the wall. I like really tangible, visible. If you prefer working on a laptop, then you keep them so that you can work on them on the laptop. The point is you want to go back to them and you want to feel like you know this regional authority, that you've got a sense of who they are and what makes them tick. So we've talked a little bit about uh, the customer journey or the customer persona. Uh, I, and I should just be precise because those are two different things. So I don't confuse people. The persona is what we just looked at, that canvas. The journey is how the customer um, might use your solution. So what, what are the different steps in their path where your solution could have uh, a role to play. And we do different kinds of customer journeys. A customer journey can explore um, uh, the, their standard workday. The customer journey could be around how they engage with a particular product or a particular uh, pastime. The journey, really what it does is it takes that bucket of time when they might be engaging with your solution. And I haven't given you a canvas here, but we can talk about that more uh, later in the session if that's of interest to you. Customer journeys are a big buzzword uh, in the uh, industry. They have their place. They're very important to understand activity uh, and how customers work. My preference is to build your customer journey with real customer intervention. So using uh, interviews, to really flesh out the journey as opposed to sort of making it up um, based on what you think you know about the customer. Um, what I'd like to do now is get into painstorming because this is one approach you can use to better understand the customer and fill in your customer persona and better understand the customer journey. So this is a nice tangible uh, way that you can engage with potential customers to really understand what makes them tick. And the reason I put this um, image up here, I love this image. So, you know, um, this fellow uh, doesn't care that the local parks board has invested, you know, a million euros to build a beautiful path. What this customer cares about is that he's got ice cream in his shopping bag and he just wants to get home and get it in the freezer. So what painstorming does, if it's done well, is it helps us identify, in this case, the pain point of this guy says, well, those architects didn't understand anything about the shortest path between A and B. And it gives customers a chance to tell us how the pain impacts them and what they do today to solve it for themselves and what they wish they could have as a better solution. So that's why I love painstorming.
So painstorming. So here's here's how I do painstorming. I told you this would be very, uh, gr you know, grassroots, and, and that's what I'm trying to do with this. So I generally, when I want to start understanding a problem space, after I've done my explore activities, I'll bring together a half dozen up to 10 participants and you can do it virtually as we're doing now. There's nothing stopping you from doing this uh, using video conferencing. Uh, you want to identify people who really have the characteristics of the customers you think you're trying to serve, right? So the, these are your example customers. Um, you want to invite them in, explain to them what you're doing and how the information is going to be used. I always try to make sure participants have fun in these sessions. They need to be able to voice their opinions, learn from other people, and have fun while they do it. And so I'll, I'll share with you a few different kinds of exercises uh, that I use uh, to get people engaged and get them thinking in the right way. You always need to follow up. This is something many people forget to do. You've got to confirm who's going to join. You really want to have, I, I, I put five here. You can do these sessions with as little as three people, as few as three people. And um, the more you follow up before the session, the more you can be sure uh, that people will join. Now, when I run these sessions, um, what we do is... Um, um, we identify the participants we want. If they are difficult participants to engage, we'll sometimes offer to make a contribution to the charity of their choice to get them to work with us. Um, you, you never want to pay them directly. That creates conflict of interest for many reasons, but that they feel good about participating, that there's a donation made to charity, that's something that helps get uh, people on board. And the contribution is symbolic. It really doesn't have to be a huge amount of money, but it's one way to say thank you to them uh, for sharing their time with you because these sessions last minimum an hour and generally speaking about two hours. So what we do uh, in terms of content. So I always prepare my script down to the minute. You have to know how you're going to spend your time. You have to understand what your objectives are. You have to understand how much time you're going to spend on each specific area. And you need to let your crowd get warmed up. And you need to do a debrief next steps. This is what we learned at the end. So people feel a sense of closure at the end of the session. For each of my areas, I've got my key questions, my nice to have questions, how I'm gonna set it up. So what's the exercise I'm gonna to use to get there? And I'm also gonna make sure that there's a balance that I don't let one person in the crowd really talk over the others. So there's a lot of management people management and participation management um, that can make or break this session. You want a scribe. You want somebody who can take notes for you while you run the session because it's really hard to run a session and take notes from the session. Uh, and um, you want to think about videotaping or at least taking photos of your visual uh, cues so that you've got a nice... Um, Reminder, you've got the, that documentation I, I talked about. And I always do in my sessions um, a space where people can sit and be comfortable and a whiteboard or flip charts so that people can get up and put their own opinions. I use lots of uh, very, uh, well, I do things like this. So bright, sticky notes with, uh, with Sharpie pens. That's what I always use. Uh, stickers so you can do voting, uh, different things that just um, help with the uh, content uh, uh, organization. The setting can be your living room, your kitchen table. It does not have to be fancy. You can book, a, you know, in a university classroom or in a small coffee shop that has a back room. Really doesn't matter. Obviously, with COVID, um, we're doing more and more of these sessions online. I actually love online sessions. We use Miro, M-I-R-O, or Mural, 
M-U-R-A-L, uh, as collaboration boards. Um, Mural for sure, and I'm pretty sure Miro as well, have free um, sites that you can actually test them. And um, they're very reasonably priced if you decide to take a, a license. Um, so there's nothing wrong with doing these online. You just um, need to make sure that people have the right technology to participate. For example, today it would be pretty tricky for me to run a session when I can't hear anyone. So doing your tests, uh, which by the way, we did for an hour before uh, the session, um, I think it's my computer to be fair, and doing your test beforehand, absolutely critical. Um, clear instructions to people and remind people the day of Remember, we're meeting at four today. We're going to spend two hours. We're talking about this. Here's the sign on. This is how you get there. Zoom, by the way, is another great way to um, run these sessions. All the tools that you're going to use. So um, if you're doing it remotely, you either use a mural board or you tell people what you need them to bring as uh, you're running the session. It's trickier to run a session without a collaboration board, but not impossible. You just need to make sure that your scribe is really listening carefully. And then if you're doing these in, uh, in person, which, you know, obviously right now is not uh, uh, suggested, but having, you know, especially if people are coming after work or at lunchtime, we tend to run a lot of sessions first thing in the morning when people are fresh. You always want to serve them some food and drink. It just helps uh, create the right atmosphere. I'd be very curious to know if any of you have run pain storming sessions. And I'm just seeing, I'm going to click on my... Uh, clicking on the surveys in the left vertical menu. I'm looking for surveys. Here we go. So here's my question to you all. Have you ever run a painstorming session with clients or prospective clients? And let's see what people have to say. Got about 10% of you, 20% who have voted. So far, we have more no's than yeses. Wait, one more. Minute, we've got about half of you have, who have voted. So we've got uh, a little bit more than 10% who have run a session. Well, that's great. So what I would ask those who have run a session, as we get questions um, at the end of the presentation, if you would like to help with the answers, I would be very keen to see what you have to say about uh, pain storming. Okay, and how do I go back now to, there we go, back to the presentation. Okay, so that's uh, the painstorming checklist. Let's take a look now at reframing. And I said at the beginning, um, reframing for me is a critical piece of activity that you must not forget and you must give it the time it deserves. And um, this, you know, little graphic for me sort of paints the picture of this. You know, when you first get to the first phase of uh, what you think is a problem space, you see this kid who looks like he's having an awful lot of fun sliding down a hill. And then as you start digging into this complex problem, you think you've identified an important element uh, of the um, the problem set, and that's that it's every Canadian kid. And I'm obviously Canadian, one of the reasons I chose this. But And you, you'd say to yourself, well, of course, Canada, filled with snow, every Canadian kid knows how to sled. 
and 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 you would be partway right. Um, and then the more you reframe the question, you realize, in fact, it has nothing to do with having fun in a park on a winter afternoon. It's that, oh, my Lord, every Canadian kid has almost died sledding, which I have to tell you, I put up my hand and say I'm part of that population. So my point here is that reframing helps you get to the true problem that you're trying to solve. And it makes you ask yourself fundamental questions about the problem space, about the client space, and about the path to the solution. So for me, reframing is a critically important way to get better and more understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve. And um, let's use uh, a for instance. So you know, one of the questions we're trying to solve, if we think about this app that we want to develop, how does it help public authorities solve their fire problems? Why do they need to solve it? Well, the answer to that one's pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, fires cause loss of life, loss of livestock, loss of crops, and many, many other problems. Well, why do fires cause these problems? The answer is because we often find out about them too late to stop the damage. Think about what's uh, happened in California recently. Well, why do we find out too late? Because uh, early warning systems. How could we act more quickly to reduce the damage? Now, we, we've just given this as an example, but in my sessions, I actually use what we call the five whys exercise. And if you just Google five whys, you'll see all kinds of templates that you can use. People hate this exercise until they realize it really works. Senior people particularly get sort of huffy about being asked why. So you have to be careful about how you use it. But later they realize, oh, you know what, we actually did, it's like peeling the layers back of the true core of the problem you're trying to solve. And I would say, be careful with this exercise. It can be, if you use it well, it can be really, really effective for you, but it can also turn off an audience if they feel like you're wasting their time. So use it carefully. The other way you can use reframing that I think is absolutely essential is you take it back to your customer personas and you ask the important questions about why those pain points create problems for them. Because the problem of, in this case, the farmer is not the same as the pain point of the public authority or of the problems of the firefighter. So it's like, you know, a Rubik's Cube or a, you have to look at the problem from many different angles to really understand what your core audience uh, is feeling in terms of a problem. The other piece of this that's important is you have to understand if you're selling a service, which of these personas is what I call the true buyer and which of them are, are secondary buyers. And so you need to accord more importance to the true buyers in terms of what pain points get solved. And this is a really great exercise, again, um, if you can get your partner, your sibling, your best friend, someone you work with to help you with this and do a bit of a dialogue, you know, role playing. That really is one way to help you dig in under this. And I often do that role play with my clients where they play the role of the customer and the role of uh, the um, solution provider. And you can, you can give them a script or you can give them questions, but it helps them get into the thinking of uh, the customer. The other exercise you can do around reframing is um, with the personas is to write the letter that the happy customer would write you if your solution was perfect. And then from that letter, 
you want to work backwards to the things that you made happen to create that happy end customer. Another exercise you can do. Um, there's all different kinds of exercises that we use. Some of them are very uh, specific to a particular point in the sessions or in the research. Others of them are simply to help people relax and um, and think differently about a problem. And I'll give you one um, that I use that I love because one of the challenges we always have is getting people out of their comfort zone, getting people to think differently or think uh, more openly about problem spaces. And so I use what's called the party planner. And you need uh, at least two people to do this. And you pair the people up. So I usually work with bigger uh, crowds. We work between 10 and 40 people at a time. And so you can imagine a room where I've got 40 people in groups of two. And the first thing you do is you have the guest and the party planner. And um, what you're saying, the, the guest is trying to give ideas to the party planner about what could be done. And in the first round, the party planner always answers no because. So the guest will start saying, oh, we should have a party outside. And the party planner says, no, because it's cold out now. And then the guest says, oh, well, we could do a party with a theme of Star Wars. And the party planner says, no, because. You let them do that for a minute, you time it, and then you move them to the space of yes, but, and I generally change roles. So the person who is the guest now becomes the planner and the planner becomes a guest coming up with ideas for a party, but the party planner always says, yes, but. Uh, we should have, uh, you know, a sangria party. Yes, but many people don't like sweet wine, so I'm afraid that won't work. Oh, we should have a party where we only eat green food. Yes, but some people don't like the color green you get the idea. And then the last round is yes and. So the party planner's job is to say yes and, and the guests uh, suggest things and the party planner builds on it. And the learning, this takes exactly five minutes to do. And what it teaches people is how to brainstorm how to come up with ideas and build on each other's ideas. And if you if you want to have some fun with people, try this exercise. What you'll see is people get enormously frustrated with the no because and the yes but. And the sound level and the excitement and the enthusiasm when you let people say yes and is extraordinary. And so you can create rules like that when you're running these kind of sessions and say, look, I am, uh, you know, I'm a very open person. I only have that one rule, and it is that you are not allowed to say no because. So there's all different ways you can get people having fun, uh, which is one of the goals of these sessions, because when people have fun, it hits different neurons in their brain. Their serotonin levels go up. They become more open. There's all kinds of good reasons, uh, good science behind this notion of helping people have fun when you're running these kind of sessions. I see the clock is ticking, so let me keep moving forward. As you can see, I love this topic. I could talk about this talk, topic for hours and hours, but I am really keen to get to, to the end of the slide so that we can have a discussion uh, at least over chat. Um, and I'm just reading. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Let's keep going. Uh, before I leave reframing, let's do another question just so I get a sense of how many of you um, are using this technique. And I think I have uh, another survey here. So let me just see. Um, how do I? Okay. I'm going to come back to that one around solution modeling. And um, last point on reframing. 
So the point about reframing is at the end, back to the documentation, is you need to pull it all together. So the reframe needs to end up with a very clear problem statement, ambition statement, that makes sense for each of the personas. And I won't read those, but we tried to give you a sense of what that would mean for the different uh, types of persona that we had put together for the fire example. Let's move. So let me just summarize. So we started talking about our customer persona, our customer journeys. We went into painstorming and the different ways you can set up painstorming, how to use painstorming. Then we went to reframing and the, uh, po the important points around reframing. Now what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time on solution modeling. And this is the place where clients want to go to immediately when we start projects with them. And the reason you don't do that is because they're not ready. And the solution they come up with without having understood the customer pain points, without having done the reframing, without putting themselves in the shoes of the target customer is they don't know what to solve for. So solution modeling here um, is about testing ideas. So using those what if sessions that you did. So once you understood the pain points is practice this, what if we could? And we do different scenarios when we uh, get into this space is we um, put different um, filters on it. So we start with what if we could, and we say anything's possible as much money, as much time, there are no constraints. And then you gradually build the, the, the real constraints in. So what if we could, and when you think about Copernicus data, I mean, the world, the universe is our oyster. There's just so much potential there. So when you're thinking about the specific pain of the fire example, where we need early warning systems, you would be questioning yourself about, what if we could identify a fire before it even started? What if we could get the firefighting materials into the space before the fire had started? What if we could, and you give yourself the time, and that's why we've put this uh, wastebasket, you give yourself the time to explore all the different what if scenarios and test them with experts. And experts could be the clients, the, the persona that we talked about, they could be scientists working in the field. They could be people who have a different perspective on the problem. The real important thing is not to limit yourself to the first what if and not to limit yourself to your own thinking. So it really is important to all the introverts out there. You really need to get out into the world and get other people thinking about your uh, potential solution and giving you feedback on it really critical point. The solution modeling phase takes as much time as the painstorming, reframing, uh, initial exploratory research put together. So solution modeling is a tricky business because you need to keep iterating. And I think if we look at this uh, wrap-up slide, my point here is this is not a linear journey you've got to include other people. So you may have the best ideas in the world. I guarantee you they will only get better if you bring other people into your process and if you explore the idea with real potential customers. So figuring out your customer persona, going through the painstorming and the reframing and the solution set, you may have to go through this a number of times before you come up with a solution set that you feel is ready to be tested uh, using the prototype, which as we said, will be uh, the next session. You may even need to go back to the beginning and rethink your customers because you might not have the right customers for the solution, or you might not have the right solution for the customers. You need to figure out which it is, 
You need to, if you're going to tweak your customer personas, you need to use painstorming to make sure that you understand them and understand the, um, the points that are most critically important for them. Uh, on the solution modeling, I think is where we have our next survey. Let me just double check that that's the case. Yeah. Here we go. So for solution modeling with an ideation session, how many of you have run these kind of sessions before? About 40% of people had voted so far. We'll give you another minute or so. Okay, super, super. So about half of you have voted. And it looks to me like um, over 20%, almost a quarter of you, have run ideation sessions. So I think that we we might have um, some interesting examples then that um, people can share uh, when we get through to the Q&A, the discussion piece. Yeah, so just under a quarter of you. That's brilliant. Super. So, what I'd like to do now is move to the Q&A, and um, I'm going to get our facilitators to help with this. So, we're going to have uh, the module being enabled now and uh, let people ask their questions. And what I'd like to do is, as the questions come in, assuming there are questions, uh, if others in the audience have a perspective, a point of view, uh, a part of the solution, I would love for you to use the chat. Uh, and um, I'm just going to move over to the public chat I've been on with the university. Uh, but um, we can all, always use the chat function uh, to share best practices. It's amazing. We've got people from Italy, from Spain, from Senegal, uh, from Germany. We've got all kinds of geographies covered. So the first question that's come in from Olivier. Hello, Olivier. Um, are the participants of the painstorming your future users? Yes. Yes, ideally, you get the future users or who you think the future users of your solution uh, will be. Now, what you learn in the painstorming is some of them really are the right kind of customer for you and some of them aren't. And you learn that through the process. But as much as possible, you want to think about the criteria of who you invite to participate in your session. A second question from Olivier, is the painstorming session a group interview disguised as a workshop? Um, uh, hmm. Yes, I think um, it's a little different because I see interviews as um, sort of, uh, I want to say monoline, it's question, answer, question, answer. Whereas what you want to get in a workshop is you want to get everybody participating. And so if Olivier had a point that he raised and then uh, Mary had an answer to it and then Gilbert had another answer, you actually want, and what I say is I try to speak 
20% of the time in a workshop and have my participants speaking 80% of the time. So my job is to guide, to give them structure and to help them understand where we're at in the process. But I really want them speaking among themselves so that I understand what it is that's most important to them. So I, I think painstorming is quite different from an interview process. And I think a really good workshop, what we call a co-creation session, is when the participants get excited together about something that they're building or a problem that they're solving. Hope that helps. Luigi, can you suggest an online service where people can use Canvas and other tools? Uh, absolutely, there's, um, there's a bunch of them. What I will do, um, is I will make a list, um, I'm looking for my facilitators to help me with this. What I will do is share the list with the facilitators. They'll make sure it gets shared <clears throat> with the group. Um, let me just online service for Canvas and other tools. Yeah, there's, there's so much great material out there, all of it free. I mean, there's just, there's no excuse not to do these things well anymore. I'll tell, I'll put it that way. Could we have a copy of the presentation for review, review? Oh, well, Antonio, thank you very much. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, there's no intellectual property rights in here. Feel free to use it as you will, and I hope it helps you in your journey to be being an entrepreneur. Uh, once again, I'll share the presentation. I think, Benjamin, you've already got it, but I'm um, happy to uh, share that with everyone. And thank you for the compliment. Alonso, so Alonso Zavala, what a great name. Um, how many ideas do you have to test when you're trying to make a solution? What's the average number? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, if, um, if you really understand the pain, that's the first part. You have to understand the problem that you're solving. The solution, what you're going to do is your first iteration of the solution, you're going to get about 40% of it right. And every time you iterate, you're going to get a better, better, better outcome. The more you test your solution with those core users, the real people who are desperately searching for that solution, the more you're going to get the right kind of information to make it better. I think on average, you're going to have to do at least half a dozen iterations until you get to something that what we call the beta product, something that you're still going to improve as uh, it goes out. And I'll give you a, a tangible example. So I'm working um, now with a startup company and we're working for a bank and uh, my startup partner, uh, this company prepared the prototype that our client is using, it took them three weeks to prepare the prototype. Now that's crazy fast. That's crazy fast. These guys are amazing and they work very, very hard. It's going to take us a year, 12 months to get a product that the bank will put in production. So three weeks to prototype. And now we're doing releases every month. So that's 12 releases until we get it into production. That for me is a fairly normal process. Hope that helps. Olivier, to me, the painstorming technique comes across as a co-design approach with you. Absolutely, co-design, um, co-creation. The point is the people who live the pain, the people who's will be your customers or the ones who can help you design the solution. That's what design thinking is all about. So um, I am a huge fan of co-creation, co-design, uh, design thinking, because you're solving the right problems in that case. I'm also a huge fan. So don't forget, I come from a very big consulting firm, PwC, and one of the things that makes us stand out in our market is our knowledge. And the partners in our firm hate me because when I let them come into my co-creation sessions, I tell them they must be quiet. 
This is not the room for the experts. This is a room for the clients and for their end clients. And I want them doing the hard work. We can then help them. We can help them in the preparation and we can help them afterwards. But in the actual design, I want our experts to be quiet, which is very hard for them, by the way. But co-design for me is a fundamental uh, building block of building the right products. You, you can tell I hardly have any opinions on this stuff. Uh, from Jean. Uh, what about going to the customer's workspace to see what and how they work and experience? That is a brilliant idea, Jean. Thank you for raising it. It is critically important. Um, we used to call it ghosting until that meant something completely different. So now we talk about shadowing or living living in their shoes. So understanding the customer's workspace uh, and how they experience their pain is a wonderful thing to be able to do. A, B, customers are way more comfortable in their own space than they are in an artificial space. So you get more true behavior tells or experience when you can go to their space. The one thing that I would encourage you to do is you want, you can do individual, but if you also do groups of customers in their workspace, that's even more powerful because you give them a voice and, and then they bounce their ideas. I'm really a fan of this group uh, notion once you've got a good sense of the problem you're solving. But Jean, absolutely right. The more you can live in the customer's space, the way they live and feel and experience the product, the more insight you will get. Great questions, by the way, everyone. Gianluigi. So good evening. Good evening to you as well. I'm glad you liked the webinar. Um, can you tell me which tools generally used to represent serials 3D with personas? Um, that are very, very clear. 3D tool. Uh, do you know what? I don't know the tools, but I will ask our UX guys who work with me and who create the tools, and I will get you some answers to that question. So let me just make sure that I understand it properly. So you want a 3D kind of tool that would show the customer, you know, if it was, I don't know, a new mobile phone, you would want them to be able to see the back and how how the screen works. Um, it could be in cartooning, I guess. You, you wouldn't mind that because I know there's a couple of very good cartooning um, apps that let you do those 3D. Is that what you're after or is it something different, Gianluigi? Something different, okay? Tell me, for the personas, you're looking for a 3D depiction of the actual people? Yep, yep, no worries. Why don't we go on to another question and we'll come back to Jane Luigi and make sure I answer it. Okay, Dumitru. Wow, that's a lovely name, okay. How do you know if you have a good idea for a business to put into practice? You know you have a good idea when after you've done your painstorming, your reframing, your solution design, your prototype that you test with those end customers, when the end customers say, yes, I would like this, please, where do I go to buy it? It's that simple. So you know you have a good idea when customers say, yes, I would pay for this. Or customers say, oh, I really like this. Can I, can I get it now? So we look for those kind of interest triggers. What you need to do in those cases is the, the follow-up question should always be, how could you make this even better? What else would you do? Or what else would you add that would make this even better? So never giving up on looking for ways to make improvements to the idea. But, but that's how, you know, with the buying signals uh, or the adoption signals are very, very apparent when you test a prototype. 
Stefano, how do you fit your approach? How fits your approach? The customer citizen data AI driven. Oh, let me see. What are you asking me here? How? Oh, how does my approach fit a data or an AI driven solution? I think that might be what you're saying. Um, it's actually, in some ways, it's easier, and in some ways, it's harder. If you don't have a tangible, concrete prototype to test, you can still do the wireframe of screenshots of, um, you know, step one, and then this happens, and then this happens. So I like to use storytelling when I'm doing a data AI or some other technology tool. The other way to do it is with video where you show, and it's trickier, I understand, not everyone knows how to make a video. It's where you show what happens in this screen and then this other screen, and then this is the outcome. So you have to use storytelling. Uh, and I'll tell you, a lot of the work we're doing today is in the data or the AI uh, field. It just is. I mean, the number of applications that are coming forward, I'm doing a lot of work around customer experience uh, and identifying vulnerable customers using a voice to text app and then machine learning or AI, whatever you want to call it, models to identify uh, sentiment, to identify uh, trigger words, to identify an analysis the conversation. So to show that to a client, we've done a video with a voiceover where you show the screens of the solution and then you say, and then Mary is phoning the bank because she didn't receive her mortgage payment. Or, so you can tell a story and they see what happens, um, but it is um, exactly the same process whether it's data, tech, app-driven, as it is a tangible product. You must understand the problem you're solving. You must understand who the customers are. You must understand their journey and how they use that data. Back to the point that was used earlier, the more you can sit with your key customers and understand where their frustrations are and how data would make it better or AI could help, the more you're going to be in a position to really identify their needs and fit the solution to their needs. Hope that answers. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jen Luigi. The tool to which I refer allows you to build scenarios in 3D. Please them to simulate the real environment. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. I can find it for you. Our, our UX guys will know what it is. So let me be... Taking a photo of your question, I will get an answer for you. I will get it to the university folks and we'll get it posted. Um, there are some fantastic tools out there, you're right, and it really does help you tell the story of what your solution is trying to do. We'll, we'll find it for you. From Jean, the article on reframing was brilliant to develop. Wow, you're fast. Okay. And see problem from all. Uh, so my question is how to move from one to zero for finding a really instead of starting out. Yeah, yeah, wow. Boy, I tell you, this is um this is the Silicon Valley problem. So the, the, there are a number of things you can do, but I'll tell you from the outset, John, I don't have the golden bullet, the one answer. Um, but I, there's a few things that have worked for me in the past. One is you bring disparate backgrounds together. So in your explore phase, and this is something I try to do, and I, I'll be honest, I get lazy, but in your explore phase, so at the beginning, when you're starting to have a nugget of an idea, talk to people from wildly different backgrounds, wildly different cultures, and people who you just don't agree with. So people who have a very different perspective from you. And the reason you do that is that we tend to, you know, experience leads us to perceive life, to, to experience things in a very specific way. So if you're looking for something outside your range of thinking, you have to go to the odd people, the people with a different 
perspective. I call them my rocket scientists. I want to go to people where I get really frustrated listening to them because I have to pick the nuggets out of what they're saying. They don't take my approach to problem solving. So that's one thing. The other is a really great exercise. Again, the more you can do this with other people who's who have a different kind of intelligence where you do a building block and there's card games you can use where um you know you've got a, a nugget of a solution and you pick a card it becomes like a party game where you have to add something bizarre to your solution and it's it's all focused on making you look at the problem from a different perspective so let me um get a few of those, I call them games. They're not games. They are business tools is what they are uh, disguised as games. And and let me get those posted as well, because that, that's the trick, isn't it? So how do you really start from a blank slate? And I think the data that Copernicus opens up for us gives us all that possibility, doesn't it? I mean, it's so new to the way we've run things in the past that trying to get to that zero ground is absolutely a great way to attack to tackle it you know that last point on this question in the innovation space disruptive innovation is like 0.1% of all innovation and iterative innovation so tweaking things around the edges is about 93% and then the rest is, you know, kind of middle ground. But that real um, out there, divergent, oh my gosh, how did they ever come up with this, is such a small fraction. And last, this is the last point on this. And the people who have those brilliant ideas, um, th the brilliant idea is one piece the actually operationalizing it and not losing the brilliance of it is where 80% of them fail. And I'm making that number up to prove my point, but where the vast majority fail. The idea is brilliant, putting it into operation is where they fall down. And that's why a lot of this session is me trying to help you get your ideas into operation because that's really a, a struggle. Enough on that one, but great question. Thank you for that one. Any other questions coming forward? How are we doing for time? We're at about the 20 past. Any other questions, any other experience that people have had either doing painstorming or reframing or doing their research around their solution that they would like to share. Well, these have been really great questions. Um, I've taken a few notes. So I've, um, the online uh, services for Canvas and other tools around design thinking. So what's available, that's one. Two is the presentation, just making sure everyone can have a copy of that. Three is the 3D app, um, uh, UX apps to represent the scenarios so they can see um, the uh, customer journey, customer persona and um, the solution set. And then the four is different games or business tools. Oh, what was the fourth one? Uh, is it not easier to get the solution from the actual user instead of trying to work it out as a provider? We always assume we can give better solution. Um, I'm not sure I understand your question, Jean. Is it not easier to get the solution from the actual user? Ah, I see what you're saying. I think I see what you're saying. The actual user oftentimes, so yes and, the actual user is often boxed in by what they know. And depending on the space you're in, now some users are great at problem solving. What I generally find is users are great at telling you what's wrong with the solution 
or with a, a product and not so great at telling you how to make it better or the ways that they talk about making it better are from their experience and they're, you know, they're around the edges. What I find is um, if you get people who are new, really new users. So, you know, think of a young trainee who's just started working on an application. They're actually better at telling you what's wrong with it than someone who's been using it 20 years. Because the person who's been using it 20 years, they figured out all the workarounds. They know how to, you know, cut corners to make it workable for them, as opposed to telling you what would make it even better. So I take your point. I think the users have a role to play, but I generally speaking don't see brilliance in terms of solution sets from users. What they are really good at though is reacting. When we take them something new and say, how does it compare to what you use today? They're really good at showing you the difference and talking about what that means to their journey, to their day, to the way they use that solution. So that's why you iterate with prototypes because that gives them something tangible to react to. I need help um, on the last point that I took down. I wrote down games and business tools and I can't remember what, um, were they for ideation sessions? I can't remember um, the exact use of them. So if someone can put in chat what what business tools was it to create the it wasn't to create the personas it was a great ask and I've completely forgotten so um, I'll, I'll I'll trust our facilitators will be able to help me on what kind of business tools from Sh Sheila um, how much time do you take to design an ideation meeting and what factors do you stress more? Um, so I have a standard approach to um, ideation that I like to use. Um, and essentially, you've got uh, intro objectives, warm up of your crowd. So they all understand why they're there. And then the, the end, so topping and tailing it, as we call it. And then the end is around the wrap up and what happens next. Because they always like, they're comforted to know what happens next. When I'm running ideation sessions, I try and get people out of their normal day. And I try to get them to see each other uh, at, outside of a work environment. So I often ask them to you know, answer questions like, what's the weirdest thing about you or what's, you know, a fact about you that your uh, colleagues don't know something that makes them think about themselves as other than in the business. Um, the next thing I do for ideation is I use a building block approach. So I never start out by just saying, okay, let's, let's figure out a better way to do this. So we start, we play in the problem space and the painstorming space. Then what we generally do is we, highlight the most important pains and why they're the most important. And I use voting. I'm a very democratic facilitator. So if we have, you know, a hundred pain points, and it often is that I've usually got somebody working with me who then puts them in themes. And then within those pains, we vote and take like the top five of those top five pains. We'll then start figuring out solution sets and then we'll vote again. And then we'll look at the solution sets again and we'll hone them down and we'll get to the real critical elements of them. And then we'll vote again. So it really takes them piece by piece through this. And what's really important is that you know exactly what you're trying to drive to and you know exactly what your timing is. So um, my internal clock, I just checked my clock, but my internal clock is starting to make me nervous because I know we're getting very close to the end of our session. I'm very good at saying, you know what, I think I have like six and a half minutes left. So you just get used to figuring it out. If you, if you need it, you keep a clock because for me, one of my golden rules is when I bring people in, we start on time and we end on time. You have to have a sense that people know exactly what's going on. They know their role. They know what they're there to do. And then you take them on a trip. So that's really important that they go on the journey with you. 
So that's what I stress. In ideation, what I don't stress, because what you leave out is as important as what you keep in, what I don't stress in ideation is how much will it cost? How long will it take to build it? What do we need? Who, do, who needs to approve this? Like all of those factors I keep out until we're really sure we know what our solution set looks like. That's the important bit for ideation meetings. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Sheila. My pleasure. Well, Alyssa, I've had a lot of fun with you guys. It's um, 1826 where I live. Um, I've got a few to-dos. If there's anything else that uh, we've got time for one last question, if there's anything else that people are curious about, um, uh, could we use the SWOT analysis that is applied in marketing and pain store? Absolutely. Absolutely, William. That's a great tool. There's all kinds of different tools out there um, that are great. Um, so the SWOT analysis in pain storming, what, the way I have used it in the past, I don't use it so much anymore. Um, uh, I, for, for me in pain storming, um, what I'm trying to get at is, you know, the real pains. And then I'm trying to get people to think freely. And I find with the SWOT, it puts them back into quadrants. But depending, if you're working with scientists, for example, that would make them feel very comfortable because they like structure. So if you're working with end customers who like structure, a SWOT is the way to do it. And, um, you know, they can come up with pains and you can put them up on the SWOT. They can come up with uh, solutions and you can put them up as well. So that's one thing. There's other canvases and that's, I'm going to share with you guys some of the different canvases from the different sites that I think work even better in pain storming. Um, and they're the ones that allow you to identify what kind of pain it is. So is it a pain that we can solve right now? Is it a pain that applies to everyone? Is it a pain that already has an existing solution? Is it a self-inflicted? And by that, I mean, is there a different way to do things that you would avoid that pain? So there's different ways that you can organize your pain points into thematic groupings. SWOT is definitely one tool that could be used. And if another really important point on that is if you're comfortable using the SWOT, if it makes you feel more confident as a facilitator, then absolutely you go ahead and use it. Two minutes to go, my friends. From Jean, my question on user is based on disaster management where you actually want the user to act in crisis and suffering. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah. So role plays, that brings me to role plays. Really, really, really powerful tools. And we do lots of crisis scenarios um, where you put people in the crisis and you... Um, you present different situations to them throughout the crisis to see how they react. And then you use that as learning to how they could have react and what could have helped them. So absolutely, this is a fantastic tool to use. Now it's pretty tricky because there's lots of setup involved. When we do our crisis scenarios, we've got about 30 people involved from our side and generally somewhere between 10 and 15 from the client side, lots of prep, lots of setup, but an extraordinarily powerful tool to help you get where you need to go. Yeah, fantastic idea. And on that much, yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate you showing up uh, you, and yes. paying attention and spending an hour and a half and asking great questions. Um, I will do my follow-ups with Benjamin probably tomorrow, so we'll get that posted quickly. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And if there are any other questions, please just feed them in to the university folks, and I will make sure that I get answers for you. On that note, I turn it back to the organizers. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks a lot. It was really a great webinar. Uh, I've seen from the audience, we have, everybody 
uh, almost uh, stay till the end. So yeah, we wish you um, a very nice evening, morning or day, uh, wherever, wherever you are. And uh, thanks for following those webinars in this MOOC. And we, yeah, we'll see you next week for the next episode. So bye-bye, everybody.